So we are joined today by none other than Clear Cherry Reeves. The one and only. The one and only. Um, We're so excited. Thank you for being here today. Oh my God, I'm excited. I I am excited to jump into this. The first one. The very first one. Inaugural. Yes. I mean. Is that what that means? Uh, I guess. I hope so. <laughs> that's what, we, that's brought what, in, <laughs> we brought in our I most famous it. member today. The most that's famous right, member. Right. You know, this this is uh, not, Seriously? we're not trying to get your followers onto okay. our podcast right. today. Okay. But. You guys get all your jokes out now. <laughs> oh, because awesome. we're retiring that one. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know, it's funny. I remember um, the first time that I heard about you mm-hmm. was actually through your brother. Yeah. I was wor- I I'd, I'd been coming to Open Door not very long, but I was working actually at the Greenville Auto Auction, and your brother worked there, mm-hmm. and he was. Um, we were talking about you, and he was like, "Yeah, my sister, you know, she does that Jesus thing like a lot. Like she's like she's like big <laughs> big into That's awesome. Jesus and I mean, all this, this kind is of stuff. Great story. And so, right. and I remember thinking, I'm like, oh, really? And so I remember cool. asking somebody else. Yeah. Uh, like, who's his sister? And he's like, oh, yeah, she writes. Um, she's an author and has she all these things. So I looked you up and I'm like, man, she's legit. You yeah, know, <laughs> like, right. this is awesome. This is right. It's really cool. So Very we're legit. excited about having you on the podcast. Thank you. For sure. Why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about what what you do on the regular basis? Because you've got a few books. Mm-hmm. You just got done writing. Uh, why don't you tell us and I'll stop, t- stop telling us. <laughs> I way <laughs> prefer other people to introduce me. So. <laughs> but, um, you know, when people are like, what is clearly stated? Uh, and who is, it's funny, people say clearly, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> but it makes sense. So um, I am an author, yes, speak at church That's some right. when I receive the honor to do so. And um, just ha- I'm, I guess, content producer. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I just sit with Jesus and talk about what he tells me kind of she's an incredible writer yeah but she also has a call of God on her life yeah yeah and that's very clear and evident by the way you read scripture see things in scripture it's a big deal and so you've written three devotional books yes three devotional books a bible study and then my children's book comes out March 14th yes which is awesome and that is tell us a little bit about that So it's called The Miracle of You, and um, y'all know, I mean, it's based on Sledge's journey. My son, Mm -hmm. who was born three months early, kind of really opened, um, this just happens to be alliteration, but miracle mindset, like in the hospital, you know, what does it mean to, you know, we're surrounded by, I think visibly, we're obviously visible people. So these miracles that we see, touch, feel, experience, but really what God says is, if you think all of that is good, then what are you? Yeah. You know, like you are the ultimate miracle. And I got to see that. I feel like, you know, through a parent's eyes with Sledge. Mm. And it honestly overwhelmed me so much um, to realize that that is just a fraction of yeah. the Lord's love for me mm-hmm. and how often I doubt that um, and how gracious he is to provide a million reminders around yeah. me. You know, so it's kind of that's the story. It's a love letter from parents to kids and then really from God to us. Yeah. And it's just meant to help you. Hey, open your eyes. There is a lot of good around and you're the best part. I love the because you've talked about it. You've been on. We've recorded a couple of podcasts for different things. And so you've talked about it a few different things. And I love to see your heart and your mind yeah. in it because mm-hmm. it's not just when you're looking at it. It's such a big picture yeah. of you know, obviously your relationship with Sledge and that journey and the miracle mm-hmm. and all that. But also you always talk about how it's a love letter from God to his children. Yeah. And that is such a cool reminder mm-hmm. um, that it's just, you know, it's a kid's book. Yeah. But ultimately we're God's kids. kids. And don't so you there's ever forget that? Do, like, I know we yes. know that, but sometimes, and I don't know if it's we're impressed by our own wisdom as <laughs> parents probably i don't know but then i'm like oh my gosh lord it's okay that i'm a perpetual student and i don't know yes. i'm your kid That's you right. know um it's a really gracious and freeing place to be when you remember your role and there's something that happens when you walk through it with your child yeah i mean there's a difference in a perspective that you take on of understanding how the father loves you mm-hmm when you walk through it and you have that love for that child and you see that there's things 
that you can fix and then yeah. there's things that you can't fix. Right. But it is also very important that when believers go through situations like you and Will have been in, that you give testimony to what God's showing you in the process, yeah. even when it's imperfect. Oh, for sure. Because they need to, people need to realize that like we, we have to navigate the same emotions that everybody else does. Yeah. But it's hopefully in the time with God that we're getting perspective of what he's trying to do. Or we're just being honest about having to learn how to trust him even when we don't know what the heck he's doing. I feel like even more so then, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think I think that's more so the reality of life is yeah. you don't know. And when you think you know. You really don't know. It's really dangerous territory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so really get into that place of being okay not knowing. Yeah. I think it's a control issue, too. So we want to be in control. But yet we sing songs about him being in control. Yeah. So he can't be in control if I'm in control. Why do you think we want to be in control? Oh, I think it's absolutely fear-based. Yeah. Are like we, we afraid he's control. not good? That's right. Of course we do. I, f I struggle with that. There's still yeah. places in my life today that when I get into that place, I, I'm fearing the fact, can I trust his goodness? Yeah. Or, you know, his goodness strips you of something you kind of like, mm -hmm. Ooh, you know, that's good. Yeah. and so that removal, you know, it's, it's almost like, I don't know. Okay. Going back to the kid example, like I just want to play for 12 minutes longer mm -hmm. and then I'll do what's good for me. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, and we know he's so grace giving. Yeah. So it just goes back to yeah. that foundation where well, it's I like we can challenge it. We like to to we like easier, like you're saying, better than better. oh yeah, comfortable. So when you look at giving control to God, mm -hmm. um, there's there's a fear of what He might actually give you. Yeah, because it could be really, really hard. Yeah. I mean, you look at all throughout people in the Bible, people throughout history when they have a call of God on their life, oftentimes it's a call to go do really, really difficult things. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really scary to walk into. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also when we get to that place, it really is about the journey with him, not about him revealing the destination to us. Oh yeah. And oh, I think, yeah. I think so often we want to know what the script and how it plays out. And I know people have said, well, if you knew what it would cost you, then you wouldn't do it, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, it's also he really just enjoys the walk with us. Oh, that's good. And I, I was thinking about that this morning because I'm wondering, like, do you think that's because I think this podcast is going to be me asking Pastor Aaron questions. Oh, I think that's good. I think that's, that's what we should do. You don't you That's fine. Do? No. Just remember, <laughs> no. you might be locked in as a regular. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you might have to. I'm good with it. You might have I'm to good. be every time. That'd be fun. Um but do you think that's because we want to impress others more than we want to be transformed? Mm. Well, I can only talk for myself. I mean, I, at the end of the day, I'm a addicted people pleaser. Same. It's so, like, terrible. I struggle with that. And yeah. so at my healthiest, I recognize it. Mm -hmm. But when fear enters the equation, mm -hmm. then it can I can start to operate in that lean. Yeah more than I can operate in just pleasing the Father. And yeah. I, I think that's why when you look at Jesus' life, he kept it very simple. I, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what did he know? What did he not know? Uh, what did he know about the end? I mean, there's definite different times towards the end of his life. I mean, the Bible's clear. It says that he knew what mm -hmm. was getting ready to take place and, yeah. and that these things were before him. But there were so many times that he just said what the father said, say, and he did what the father said, do. And I'm like, that is the simplest way to live. Yeah. You know, because he was really consumed with just the approval of God. And I think so, you know, for me, I, I really do wrestle, especially in the in the job that I have. I mean, I, you know, I hate to call it a job, but the ministry the, Mm. You're, you're constantly trying to weigh out what people's opinions are, yep. and they're constantly sharing them with you. I mean, you know, like, I mean, Unsolicited <laughs> advice. There's not too yeah. many Sundays that I'm not getting text messages that are opinion-based. And yeah. it's like, you know, I, I don't really, I think I've, when I'm at my healthiest, it's really not a plan to me. There's not like a strategy. Yeah. It's more like, all right, God, what are you saying do next? Mm -hmm. 
The fear pocket is when you operate that way, there's going to be many times that people look at you like you're a freaking idiot. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Because it means that you're not going to do the thing that makes sense all the yeah. time, you know? And so, well, and I think because so many people operate in that world of trying to people please in the essence, or, you know, clear you're in that space with, um, what content production on mm-hmm. yeah, you're in a social space. media She's stuff in like social that. media which is <laughs> yeah, like oh my god <laughs> purgatory you talk about getting opinions <laughs> on a regular basis <laughs> that's right like, my god. but so many people strive for that and they want that yeah. but like want, do they do they well right yeah because i mean it's the famous thing of we want our perception of a perceived reality a without the sacrifice to get there be the maintenance required to stay healthy there. That's right. Yeah. Right. That'll preach. And then see what that warrants as far as um, compassionate boundaries. Mm. I would define it, mm. maybe. You Did know, you just I say think, boundaries. I feel like that's watch a password. Did you hear that? <laughs> it really I, is. That, 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 that. I know. We'll have and, to bleep that and out. And I'm really, <laughs> I'm really not good at them. So that's either. why everybody's listening is going to be like, really? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's so crucial. And, you know, I think this is kind of sidelining, but everything goes back to this is the importance of the word. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, I think the health of anybody's position, the only, I mean, that's the Lord's love letter to us. So, like, mm-hmm. how are we going, okay, Lord, I just want to be content in your affection for me. I want you to hit me with something while I'm on my, to, my way to work. I'm not going to make time for you. That's You've right. already talked to me. You've already sat with me. And I want you to tell me something in my convenience, mm. right? And that fits into my world. Yeah. 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 That's good. Well, it um, goes back to control. Yeah. We want to control. Not only do we want to can be in control of us, we want to be in control of what God tells us mm-hmm. when think, He tells us. I think that's also because we don't really know the Father. Ooh. Because if we did, we would absolutely want to just sit. And marinate and what he says, what he says about us. We would want to go where he leads, right? Like we we would be consumed. That would be an all burning fire. And I know that sounds so I don't know, Christianese, yeah. right? Like, oh, I just want to spend time with Jesus. No, but like, it's real uh, are you aware yeah. of my reality? So so I was on the uh I was I was meeting with my therapist three weeks ago and I was uh just kind of processing some stuff and, and um it really felt like God had told me to meet with this person and, mm-hmm. and I do on a regular basis now and just trying to help me get my mind around stuff, my heart around stuff. And he said something to me that kind of blew my mind. And I mentioned it, we're recording this on a Monday and I mentioned it yesterday in a message and I actually spoke it at the men's forum this last time. But when Jesus come up, comes up out of the water, when he's water baptized, the father says to him, this is my son mm. who I love and who I'm well pleased. Mm. And when I was hearing that, he, the therapist reminded me of that. And I was like, yeah, no, duh. And he was like, but who needed to hear that? Was that for the crowd or was that for Jesus? Yeah. And didn't you talk about ambition? Can yes. You, can you tell them what you oh, said? Oh, well, I said God doesn't <laughs> need our ambition. He wants our obedience. That's yeah. good. And so here Jesus comes up out of the water. He's the son of God. And yet God says, this is my son, who I love, who I'm well pleased. He, God didn't say that for people. He said that for Jesus. And so and the therapist said to me, he said, Aaron, every single day that you wake up, you need mm-hmm. to remind yourself that you're his son. Like he chose you. Yeah. He said he loves you and it's not based on your performance. Mm. And he said he's well pleased in you. And I was like, oh, it covers my gosh. three areas, your identity his affection for you and your ambition is covered. That's exactly right. If you enter with that. He said every single day you need yeah. to remind every single day, every single person needs to remember mm. and see, then the father said it twice. So he said it there. And then he said it on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he said on the Mount of Transfiguration, that was for Peter, James and John's benefit. Yeah. So yeah. they knew that he was, Jesus was different than Moses and Elijah. Right? right. And so we really get this place of saying, are we really connected to the identity that God has for us and what he says we are, are we connected to our own identity? And really it boils down to, in that case, who we listen to more. Yeah. So like we know a lot of that stuff in our head. Like, I mean, if you'd ask me, I'm a, I'm a pastor, my God. Right. I mean, I know that God loves me, right? Yeah. I know that I'm his son and I know that he's well pleased in me, but I don't know it. 
Right. Yeah. I know it in my head. I don't mm-hmm. know it in my heart. Mm-hmm. And so if we're going to really live into what the Father says about us, then we have to consistently remind ourselves. And that's what goes back to the word is a love letter. Yeah. And it's a book of boundaries. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, if you really want to know, <laughs> you gotta how, believe it all. You got to really know that like the whole yeah. point of the Old Testament is that God is setting up boundaries yeah. for the children of Israel. I mean, he's given them law, but he's also, when they go into the promised land, he's like, you're not even going to get all the promised land at one time because yeah. the wild animals and the people would take over. But like the only way that you know that a boundary is actually holy and good is if you walk it out, right? Uh. So it's like you're in it. You can talk about it all day long, but until you set it up and allow the Lord to go, okay, see, it's still good. That was, that was protection. And maturity. Until then, right, right. Like there's some boundaries that I give my son that he walks in, but he doesn't think they're good. And he (laughs) won't think they're good until he's probably (laughs) 43, right? Right. And has a kid himself. Yeah. And so it's really like there is that place of trust and then there's that place of faith. And I think that those two things are very different. But it is that place like faith is a powerful thing like that, that. That's stuff that we don't actually see, but we have this hope that holds steadfast and secure. But trust is experiential. Trust is the history of walking with God. Yeah. Causes trust to be birthed. So when he tells us to do something that doesn't feel right, we still trust him enough to do it. And yeah. then it gives you courage, right? That's right. Because I think people are like, oh, I just feel stuck. And sometimes I don't want to ask them are you are you taking the next step God's called you to because I think where you're at is you're you're scared and God's going hey I've already given you that and if you would just walk right there yeah then I would affirm that and you would once again set your eyes trust and then keep going you know I think that's such a beautiful picture of so oftentimes it's what is it in I think it's, it's either Psalms or Proverbs he talks Mm -hmm. about your the word is a a light into your feet yeah Yeah. Psalms yeah and so oftentimes we're like kids who are scared of the dark. Mm-hmm. And so what the Bible says that that faith, that trust is putting that, looking at the light, not looking up into the dark. Yeah. And so when we take that step, the light moves us forward. So good. But so oftentimes we're looking, we're scared of what people are thinking. We're scared of boundaries that we don't know what it's going to be. What's going to happen when that boundary is a step mm-hmm. uh, or put into practice? And so we just need to take that next step rather than looking in and being scared of what's out in front of us, what could be rather than what is. Yeah, well, I, I do think. And I mean, this is one of the things that I do love about what Clear does. And, and I've said this to her. I've said this on other podcasts, but she points everything back to the word. Right. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of influencers out there, Christian influencers that, and she hates that, that word, but, <laughs> so dumb. but, but she, th- th- they don't point people to the word. They point people to witty sayings. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so like what I wish people really would understand the word, my, my dad taught it me this way. He, I was preaching one time and I came off stage and as I was, as I was asking my dad, like, what did you think? And he said to me, I thought it was great. He said, one issue I have. I was like, what? And he said, you read the word of God in the same monotone voice or the same voice Mm. that you shared your opinion about it. Mm. Oh. And he said, the word of God should always be read differently than anything else. Yeah. That's good. And so, like, I mean, if you ask any of our communicators, pretty much the only critique I will ever give is that you read the word without any passion. Yeah. The word of God should always be read differently. And so when we start reading people's opinions about the word more than we're connected to the word, then we're actually building our life on sand. Well, that'd be like, okay, visual. Someone's actually watching or just like imagine you're in one room and you think Jesus is in the other and you send someone in there. And then they come back and they're like, this is what he said. And how much more would you follow what he says if he sits there eye to eye and says, this is what I have for you. Right. You know what I mean? Like I, that's, I'm going to take that way more to heart. That's right. Trust it way more if I'm sitting right there and he's giving me the time and I'm listening and I actually trust that I'm his kid so I can hear him. That's right. You know? Why do y'all, because both y'all are in that space where you have the opportunity, Mm -hmm. if you wanted to, to really lead people into 
wherever you want to take them. Astray. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, why Gosh. do you think there's such an appeal? People are just now uh, tapping. I just, right. I just got anxiety. Oh, I was no. like, oh my God. <laughs> why do you think there's such an appeal? Because we see that everywhere people are, are using it, whether it's political, they're using, they take the word, they take concepts and truths from scripture to push their own agenda, mm. to push even just to gain follower account. Why do you think there is such an appeal to that? Mm. Go ahead, Claire. Bring um, your wisdom to the game. Well, I think people have a very delusional idea of, um, here's the thing. I think our flesh is really good at succeeding at things that don't matter correct so i think we when we start to associate our identity with our impact Mm. and we put that before the other right if i can have impact then i will matter Mm. right but how about i matter so wherever i am i have impact that's right that changes things yeah you know so i think it's just that priority. Yeah. Um, and you know, here's the thing we have heard mentality like, mm-hmm. Oh, you're doing something I want to follow. Yep. And I think respect and honor is huge. You know, I mean, I honor and respect pastor Aaron so much. And so, but like I'm, and so I would, you know, I know you're not going to lead me astray, mm-hmm. you know, but also I know he would tell me, Hey, don't wish for the impact I have. You have impact right where you, where you are. And I think we hear that, And for some reason, I mean, you know, social media is this like glitzy, glamorous world. When you strip back and like pull the veil back, I think it really would behoove all of us to walk up the stairs to heaven every day and go all of like, what's going to matter up here? Yeah. You know, because how often do we invest? And it seems so foolish. Like it's the most elementary concept I know, but to take literally you have a treasure chest and you have one that like gets to elevate. Mm. Okay. And you have another that's going to hang out here. And we are exhausting ourselves filling the one that stays. That's crazy. I don't, yeah. un- like, why? Yeah. I mean, I do it too. I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not like shaming anyone. That's it's right. just, it's this um, temptation. And here's the reality. And it's, scripture is um, compassionate once again, but interrogation of our souls. That's and right. I Ooh. think it's, that's why it's so important, mm-hmm. right? Because it is, the Lord is never saying, this is what I see in you. Um, I'm ashamed. It's, this is what I see in you. I love you. This is what I'm calling you out to mm-hmm. walk with me. This is like, he sees you through the eyes of Jesus, right? But in order for us to get there um, and to not really have the wrong audience with our lives, I think we have to go back to that, you yeah. know? Um, and also it takes discipline. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, if I'm waking up every day, I That's mean, we're habitual creatures. Too, I know, I, I know. I am just totally <laughs> hitting everybody with the words they don't want to hear. But here's the reality. I don't care if they share this podcast. I care if they listen or they do something different. That's exactly right. Preach. Okay. Because a changed, transformed life is the greatest preacher. I don't care about the nuggets. They, they go away. They don't fill anybody up. That's right. You know? So... And I think here's the reality, too, is the more mature you get and the more that you walk with the Lord, the less you care about whether other people see your transformation. That's right. Because you know you're delighting in him. Well, that's what, it goes back to the, this is my son whom I'm more yeah. pleased. Right? Yeah. Identity. Yeah, that's I, your identity. I think, yeah. too, is that selfish ambition. I mean, and I, I, I believe ambition is really, uh, I mean, I've, I've said it, there's no such thing as godly amb- ambition. God doesn't need our ambition, yeah. but we have to realize that ambition is in all of us, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's there. And when, when we operate in ambition, we can use the word very manipulatively. Yeah. And I just think that we have to understand that that's been the ploy of the enemy for ever since the garden. I mean, he, he didn't, he didn't say something new. Yeah. He right. just added to it. Added to what God had said. And so I think there's a lot of that. And I think a lot of people, I mean, I would say this way, the the thing that we try to do every weekend is we're not actually teaching new things. We're reteaching what people have been mistaught. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. I mean, it's not like they're learning something new. They're actually relearning what they've been taught wrongly. Well, yesterday you talked about 10. Yeah. And I was thinking about that a lot. It was so good. 
And how dare we, but also we do it, say the words of Jesus or scripture in a tone that looks nothing like them. Yes. Right? That's confusing. Yeah, it's so confusing. And so it's like it's then it's taking that. And I just think, okay, if, like if Jesus is talking to someone in Scripture, it is always through the lens of when you hear this, it's to edify you. That's right. You know? So I think, too, in culture, it's just, I mean, if you you care way more about being seen than letting some, no, someone know their love, that Scripture can um, be easily manipulated. Yeah, I mean, like, you know? I, yeah, uh, the Grammys, I think, were just on TV a week or so ago. And, oh. I mean, social media went bonkers yeah. over the stuff on the Grammys. And I was like, what did y'all think was going to happen right. on yeah, the Grammys? Say, no, like, no, I no can't shock. believe all the Satan worship and how it's out there. And I'm like, what What did you think yeah. they did? I mean, yeah. what, have y'all not been listening to their music for <laughs> the last 20 years? I mean, I'm like, what is happening? And I'm like, what the stuff that's going on in the world does not bother me. Like I, I yeah. don't it that does man, I'm like, that's the world being the world. At least they're being open about it now. Yeah. So that that's what concerns me is the garbage that's going on in the church. Oh yeah. How we use the word for our selfish desires and mm-hmm. what we want to take place. How we keep people in bondage or we misteach the gospel. Yes, maybe trying to honor God, but more trying to build our own fame. Like, I mean, Paul didn't write the letters that he wrote thinking that we were going to read them for the next few thousand years. Yeah. It wasn't like he had some deep revelation that these words are going to go all over and people are going to preach them for the next 2,000 years. I mean, <laughs> this is going to end up in Greenville, right. North Carolina. I mean, like, that, that's not what he was thinking. He was just loving people mm-hmm. and doing what love does, and that's correct them, tell them the truth. And just, I mean, so, so when we get in this place of, I think social media can be used for good, but I also have to, we also have to recognize the unhealth that it is produced because we are always measuring ourselves against other people. Yeah. And churches like, please, when you're listening to this, don't think that pastors don't do the same thing. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. there are seasons and times that I have to shut everything down. I'm on social media less now than ever because I don't want to hear what somebody else is saying. It's really hard to hear what God's saying when all you're hearing is what other people are saying. Oh, yeah. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. You know, and so like one of the things that 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 Jesus practiced, which I think is, I mean, Golly, we should do a whole podcast on just the life of Jesus. And I know oh, that's that's do been like done series. before, but it's literally yeah. like what did he practice? Yeah. It wasn't what did he do? It was more how he practiced his life. But like Jesus would get away to solitude. Right. It's so funny you're saying this because I was just this morning, I don't think when uh, I think it's in Luke about um the feeding of the five thousand and right before it is the feeding of the four thousand that's right right? that like it's skipped yeah um but literally right after this he like people are flocking and he is like adamant that the disciples get away and rest that's right you know and i think it's henry nowen who talks about how we have to have a ministry of presence Mm -hmm. and in order to have a ministry of presence we have to have a ministry of absence that's exactly right if we don't remove ourselves we are so saturated. I mean, that's that's why I know it's the D word, the discipline, but it's not going to be fun always, no. right? And like, I mean, I know it's so nice to have multiple voices around going, yeah, that's good, or what about this, or all of that. Right. But I think, um, I mean, that's our protection, you know? Well, I mean, the only way to act, the gateway to wisdom is going to be that you actually sit with the Father. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think the number one thing, and for pastors that are listening, I mean, I, I talk about this all the time. Like, I have people in my life that help me monitor my volume. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, because if, you, if you're constantly— Now, do they monitor your, your volume going out? Do they have any, like, input on your volume coming in as well? Yeah, so they would definitely say they limit my volume going out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, one of, like, the main things here is, like, I mean, we have a teaching team. There's only a certain amount of weeks I I speak a year. That's evaluated every single year by my oversight elders and my pastors. 
because they are sitting there praying through what is the volume of Aaron's voice supposed to be. Mm. So there's a lot of opportunities I turn down. There's a lot of things that I say no to. Because when you get in this place, you'll start being driven by people's expectations instead of obedience to God. Oh, yeah. right. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like, who is the one monitoring my voice? And that gets really complicated mm-hmm. because you're like, okay, God's given me this space. I want to steward it well. But what does that mean? Does that mean I'm fearful over it? Does that mean yeah. I'm controlling over it? Or what's that volume? The reason why I talk about accountability and people helping me with that so much is because I get really confused about it. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I supposed to do? What am I not supposed to give up? What am I supposed to give up? Yeah, I'm struggling with that now. And so it's like, really, what is that place? Because it it, it gets really confusing because you really do want to honor God with the place that he's given you. But you also don't want to control it because he's the one that gave it to you. And you've talked to me about this before, but also realizing that like, Trusting God's yes and trusting God's no means you won't have a wasted opportunity, right? Like, you're it, if it's not for me, it's not an opportunity. That's right. Right? But that is so hard at the moment. Oh, gosh. You know, because it's like, Lord, are they going to knock again? And he's like. Well, gonna... because people say, like, if the momentum's with you, you better take advantage right. of right. it. Right, right. You know, and so. Yep. And, and all those things are at play. And I so it just means that we can reach a level, but it's actually at that we're not ready to be there. And when we're there, if our character isn't there, then we will never maintain, we'll never yeah. inhabit it. Yeah. You know, and so really saying, all right, what is the volume? What is the pace? And I think Jesus was amazing at that. I mm-hmm. mean, there was some of the largest moments in his ministry that he would pull away to recenter himself with the Father instead of with the crowd. Yeah. And, and, and it means that there were moments that Jesus lost the crowd. Oh, yeah. He, you know, and so getting that place of just saying, God, what is the boundaries of my life for this season? What's mm-hmm. the disciplines of my life for this season really protects us and helps us maintain correct balance. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of over spiritual people that 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 look down on balance instead of saying, hold on yeah. a second, living a balanced life is very important yeah you know because when i'm in when i'm out of balance what it really means is that certain people's voices that should matter don't matter and people's voices that shouldn't matter do matter that's the bottom line when i'm out of balance when i'm out of order Mm -hmm. then lauren's voice doesn't matter enough Mm -hmm. and the opinions of social media matters too much which here's the deal even in that place where maybe the outside world thinks sure what like how succeeding things are great whatever that's that internal restlessness you know and i think that's why we have a lot of cultural anxiety especially around people who are in leadership positions because they get to a point where due to their intense ambition which is glorified Mm. right i'm going to keep going i'm going to keep going hey can i stop for a second wait someone else has an expectation that i show up right now i'm going to keep going and and you can't sustain that you know what i mean and here's the deal is i think if we're honest we don't even like that lifestyle no. like who wants to Mm-mm. work so hard you don't even enjoy it Mm-mm. what like, do y'all think let me ask y'all a question what do you think is the healthy what is the characteristic of the of a healthy leader what do you think is like number one, one number one characteristic of a healthy leader <laughs> oh, i got I something in my brain but i'm like what, what do y'all think? <laughs> this is uh this is uh this was like a Pastor Aaron trap question. It is. No. He already, said, this was, this was his setup, which is fine. No, I'm, process, is. I'm processing myself because I'm like, you know, what is it that, that we're most drawn to in this day? So what's the characteristic that, you know, uh, that we think is the healthiest uh, aspect of being a leader, characteristic of a leader? Oh, well, for me, and then I'll, I'll be quick and I'll, no, I'll you're good. pitch it over to you. But I think it's there's got to be a, a huge level of humility. That's in, mine. Yeah, so there yeah. We go. I hope we're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's good. I mean, I pre- yeah, I think that's good because I would agree. But let me ask you a little bit deeper question then. What what's the evidence of humility? Oh yeah, because you can have false <laughs> humility pretty quick. <laughs> so I might have goaded you in. There we go. So I would I would say that the healthiest leaders I know have a healthy sense of vulnerability. That's good. Well, I, it sounds good. Mm unpack it a little bit what's the vulnerability what does that look like yeah i just think the 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 reality of being able to let me say it this way so 
this is good. I, th- I think this is going to be helpful for some people. Well, because, and the reason I'm asking is because I have, I personally can be very vulnerable if I'm in control, which is a false sense of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm truly vulnerable, it's. What do you mean when there's right a now. controlled perception? You're well, and it's not real vulnerability, right? right. But it, if I can, I can be open, honest, yeah. humble, all yeah. of those things, as long as I'm in control of, yeah. of the Feedback. perception. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. Yep. And so, so how do you, what, what does that look like? What's the vulnerability look like? Mm. I think several things. So I would tell this story is that when my dad passed away, um, I knew I wanted to um, do the uh, uh, eulogy at his funeral. And so uh, Pastor Jimmy called me the day of, and he said something to me that I've never forgotten. And he said, Aaron, when you stand on that stage, you're going to put on your pastor garments and, and you're going to do it. It's going to be great. And there's going to be a level of vulnerability in that moment. But he said, it's going to be a job. Mm-hmm. And he said, when you come home that night, you need to take that garment off. Yeah. And you need to be a son. And I realized of how jacked up my job is. Yeah. Like there's a level of we do this. This is what we do. We, we do some of the weirdest mess. We, we do funerals. I mean, I remember not long after my dad died, I did the uh, funeral of a, like a two and a half year old kid. Hmm. And I was like, who does this? Yeah. Like who, who does this and just functions? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like Treats we, it as normal. We, we just walk in and out of hospital rooms and we, and we just do those things. And those are extremes. But there's just a level of saying, do I care more about what people think or can I be honest? I ask myself that all the time. Like even in my speaking, there's something that is so grace filled by God, mercy, maybe, that I do this in where I grew up. Like I, because there's a lot of people that, that are here that I can't fake out. Like, I mean, right. my oversight elders have known me for 25 years. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm 43. I mean, some of them know me longer than that. Elliot's known me for 35 years almost. You know what I'm saying? You think mm-hmm. about that. So there's not this, this ability to be something different than what I am. And I think just really being able to say, how, how free do I feel to undress in front of people and the need to perpetually look like we have it all together is the most unhealthy thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'd be very, I mean, like yesterday I spoke, but I mean, I'm very honest right now. Like, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what, I mean, I've never, I've never had a church this large. That's why I have voices in my life, but I've Mm -hmm. never been here before. I don't know. Yeah. And, and I think the need for success or what looks like success is probably the greatest dictator of unhealth or the indicator yeah. of unhealth. Because it's like, does does walking, we know that walking with Jesus is not always going to look successful. But we also feel the need to get it right every time. And God does not expect that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's probably um, where just like deep, deep, soul sadness sets in right where you know deep in the fiber of your being that you are crafting and curating a relationship with the Lord that you don't actually experience yes and I oh well that's good and then I'd say this so so and I'm an extrovert right so that's why we do the good amen podcast we have no idea where it's going but at the end of the day this is healthy vulnerability is being able to admit you made a mistake yeah is as a leader as soon as you don't feel like you can admit that and everything becomes a swing campaign, that's where you, it. That's but let me exactly, tell you I'm what, the, re- the reason I'm going to keep following you if I'm walking behind you, is not because you've stayed straight and narrow the whole time. It's because when you had a misstep, you turned around and said, my bad. 
Yeah. Right? Like, that's right. I, because I know you're imperfect because right. only Jesus is perfect. So if there's not that vulnerability there, how can I trust you? You can't. Right. And in fact, it's a model for you that and nobody you know you, can keep. You know you can't trust yourself. No. And I think that's where that like, yeah. oh. Well, that, I mean, that's where you narcissism know? enters the church, right? Yeah. Is that, oh, if I make a mistake, I really can't admit it. So you start believing that you don't make a mistake. And, that it, you know, and it just gets all weird. And I'm like, God never expected that. I you think know? you're right, though. I think vulnerability is that I'm just thinking of the little. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, the way your brain he thinks. He says, I know, I'm right. <laughs> yeah, you're, I know you're right. No, I'm saying, I know how your brain thinks. You're putting it all together. You're but like, I'm this, like is, this is going to end up being a book. I no, promise. That's, that's no, right. That's right. I'm, but I'm saying your humility, because that gives you the avenue to vulnerability, right? And the vulnerability is the place of dependence. That's right. And the only way that a leader can stand up is if they're falling on Jesus. A hundred percent. Right? So, yeah, that's yeah, good. I think, I, think it's, I think the vulnerability thing is a big yeah. deal. And I think there's an unhealthy vulnerability. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so For I sure. think there's a place, like, every once in a while, I'll learn to be like, hmm, you're saying too much. <laughs> you know, not, Sounds like Will. Not from Reel a standpoint, it but it's like, reel it in a little yeah. bit. Like, yeah. Because there's an emotion connected to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think just really getting that place that we have the people in our life that, that their volume matters more. And it's important to hear them. Yeah. And listen to them. So humility would probably be the greatest aspect of humility is honestly, am I able to listen to my wife without her having to raise her voice? That's good. Mm -hmm. Am I willing to listen to those that God's placed in my life without them having to tell me, thus saith God? And then the maturity then partners with that to say, mm -hmm. I heard what you said. Now tomorrow I'm going to live differently. Right. Yeah. Because like we can hear it all day long and we can be, that's right. That point where, but until we actually let it like infuse into That's us, good. you know what I mean? Because I think what you can do is you can give somebody, hey, I'm going to hear you and I'm going to listen. But if I don't actually appreciate value and think your voice mm. has priority and where I go and what I do, then my ambition is still going to out. Mm -hmm. is your, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Like, it, it really is important. And that's you, where that conflict would come back around. How do you discern who you listen to? Mm. Because in for, for me, <laughs> if, if I'm like, if I'm just wanting to raise a platform or do yeah. some certain these things, I can surround myself with people that are going to agree with me. They're going to tell me what I want to hear. So how do you, how do you identify those people in your life? I know you mentioned like your spouse, your wife, your husband, but how do you identify those people in your life? Mm. Well, I mean, I think, um, through a lot of prayer, through a lot of history, and through the trusting of God-given order and authority. Yeah. Ooh. So, like, the, the, this third one is probably the biggest one. Yeah. Right? Is so that I, I trust that God puts in place authority. So let me give you the example of, like, Pastor Jimmy and my dad. So those are the only two pastors I've ever really had in my life. And, and I value them. I love them. Uh, my dad I didn't have a choice on. <laughs> I had a heart choice, but I didn't have, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, he was always that voice in my life. But, you know, there was a really big shift in my life with my dad in my middle 30s, um, in probably a little bit of early 30s. Like, I actually began to respect him as that voice in my life instead of comply to him as that voice in my mm. life. And that's two totally different things. Yep. So my dad had actual authority over my life, right? He employed me. He was my dad. He was all those things. But there was a heart posture in me that shifted, that looked at him as my pastor, as that voice in my life. And it really shifted my whole leadership perspective and the thought process of authority. And uh, so much so that when I became senior pastor, my dad on a golf course, which is where all spiritual things take place, amen. he, uh, amen, amen. That's a good amen. amen. Right? A good okay. amen. Right. Um, <laughs> and he said to me, he said, I want to be your dad and you need to go find a pastor. Mm. And it was interesting because really what the conversation went to at that point was authority. And it wasn't, it wasn't anybody trying to grab for it, but this is what I remember telling them because I thought about it and I was like, okay. And I said, but dad, you've always been the number one voice in my life. And I said, so who is going to be accountable for the church from this transition on? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, for years, if you've said it, I've done it if it doesn't disagree with scripture. Yeah. And I said, my lean is still going to be to do that. 
And I said, the accountability issue for the church matters. Because, I mean, Hebrews talks about that you're going to give an account for those yeah. that you shepherd. And he said, no, no, no. From that moment on, that transition on, you're accountable for the church. And he said, you need to go find a pastor. And he said, whatever I say, you need to make sure you take it within the light of the fact that you're accountable for it. Well, that changed things, right? Because now I have, I'm the one that's accountable for it. Yeah. I don't get to get to heaven and blame dad for it. Right. Yeah. So that's when I pursued Pastor Jimmy Witcher. And from a distance, I checked out him, Jimmy Evans, another pastor, Brady Boyd, some guys, and I knew they all ran together. And I greatly respected them, and I respected them because, to me, they weren't flashy. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, they were, I don't mean that, like, in a bad way. I just, they were very consistent, and they had churches that I was like, I really would love to have a church like that one day. Not their size, but just, they were spirit-filled. They were just very grounded and had been mm-hmm. through storms. The churches had been through like survived. major yeah. storms, you know, and they, they had thrived and survived. And so I wrote a letter to pastor Jimmy and, uh, literally it was like a two page letter pouring out my heart. I wrote it to another pastor and within 24 hours of getting that letter, pastor Jimmy called me. That's so cool. That's cool. Yeah. What's well, well, such an amazing, like I, when I look back on the journey of that, like it was banana, it was so God ordained, yeah. right? Because Pastor Jimmy was in a transition between him and Jimmy Evans, and he was becoming the senior pastor of Trinity. Jimmy Evans was transitioning that. I was the first person, first pastor to call Pastor Jimmy Witcher my pastor that he had ever had because he was in the same transition that I was of becoming senior pastor, you know? Yeah. And so, so I understood that I needed that authority in my life, right? checked out that authority, obviously went through those processes. But at the end of the day, I had to give the gift of trust. I had to say, God, I'm going with it. I feel like this is where you're leading me. I don't know him completely well, but I think this is what you're saying to do. And I'm going to trust that authority is a part of your kingdom. And so I trusted. Mm -hmm. And because I trusted then God orchestrated it, and here we are seven years later, and, and the rest is history, and he's become one of the most influential voices in my life and a great friend and somebody who I trust who is absolutely different than I am. He leads totally different than I do. Like I'm an extrovert, he's an introvert, and he creates all this tension in my life, you know, because he's just stretching me all the time, yeah. but it's good for me. And so I think that, you know, Walking and understanding that really God gives us authority for our benefit and our good, not control, is really important. And having a a, a heart that listens. I mean, who do you listen to? Yeah. yeah. Like, who can tell you no when you feel like God's saying yes? Yeah. That's I mean, good. that's at the end of the day, like, that's the number one thing is like, when I feel like God's saying yes, who can tell me no? And as leaders, we have to have people that can tell us no. It's for our protection. We lie to ourselves more than anybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're really good at convincing ourselves of things. Yeah. <laughs> and conv- and putting that stamp of approval from God. Yeah. We convince ourselves, no, this is from God. I yeah. know this is from God. Yeah. But if we're really being honest, it's like, yeah, yeah you right. want to do that. <laughs> you know? Well, people are forever putting their call above their marriage. And mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, mm-hmm. if you wanted to do that, then you shouldn't have gotten married. Yep. So like at the end of the day, if you want to try to put your call and want to keep that up there and you're going to say, hey, if God's calling me to, I'm going to do it whether my spouse likes it or not, then you shouldn't have gotten married. Yeah. You should have yeah. stayed single because that'd be a whole lot more convenient. Well, Welcome and to the Valentine's Day podcast. That's yes. right. Valentine's <laughs> But if now that you're married, hey, kind of unity is a big deal. And if right. she ain't on board it's or true. he ain't on board, yeah. you need to shut it down. Yeah. I had a, um, a guy I was talking to. He was kind of pouring into my life a little bit and I was young in ministry and all this kind of stuff. And he made this statement. It was stuck with me forever, but he said that God established Genesis two long before acts two. Mm. Mm. And so he's talking about Genesis two, of course, is family, the marriage, yeah. the unity there and acts chapter two is the start of the early church and all that. And it stuck with me forever. Well, it's like you have that order, right? Like you That's just right. said, right? And then you have your alignment and then the assignment. But when your assignment starts to trump the other, mm. Mm. you're in trouble. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, you're thinking when you, when you do that, it's about ambition and it's about our timing, not God's. That's right. Yeah. 
And God, I mean, like, God's not stressed. Yeah. Like, he's not like, oh, the election's coming up. we got to make some things happen <laughs> yeah. quickly. You know, it's, he's yeah. not in that stress. It's, yeah. it's not, his timing is perfect. That's right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, he ain't stressed about all the yeah. stuff that we're stressed about. He's not really worried. He's not. He's not really, he's not worried yeah. <laughs> about the stuff yeah. that we're concerned about. He's already been there. He's already experienced it. He's already created it. He's already done everything in that time. It's, he, he's, he's not living in time like we are. And so really come to that place of like, all right, God's really got it. Yeah. And even if I screw it up, he's still got it. Right? Yeah. Like, so my biggest thing to all of us is that it's okay if you make a mistake. Yeah. It's just not okay to act like you didn't. Right. Yeah. That's good. You know what I'm saying? Like that. I mean, at the end of the day, like yeah. just be willing to admit it, be willing to repent of it and yeah. move on from it. But just don't act like you didn't make a mistake. Yeah. Oh, and I'm, I, isn't, I mean, that's the greatest, I don't know. Freedom? Sermon. But to well, other people, true. right? Yes. Is to like, to say that we made a mistake. I think too then. Like, that's when the grace of God becomes alive. You know what I mean? Like, I trust God's goodness when I know I did not choose something That's exactly right. Because he said, you know what, Clear? I'm going to be me anyway. That's right. Because I'm faultless. I'm going to stay faithful even when you chose to shut the door and go your own little way and then turn back around. You know? So, um, but I think what's cool about that story, Pastor Aaron, is you sought him out. And I think, too, you sought out... Okay, I'm going to find someone who challenges me, mm-hmm. and I'm going to look at the fruit of their life. Not, oh, they have heavy impact, but I can see that they've been walking with Jesus. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. and then you were intentional yeah. with reaching out. I think it's important. I think that yeah. God wants to ordain. I mean, I wish, um, well, I'll just say it this way. Like, nobody's voice in my life matters like my wife my oversight elders and pastor Jimmy, he's my man. And and I mean, at the end of the day, he's my pastor. I love him and I'm ride or die with him, you know? And, and it's just, I don't care how many people know him. I wish more people did know him because he's that great. Right. You know, but like, that's the type of leader that I hope and wish that every pastor would have in their life to be able to just speak to and, and it's just important. But I think that God will open those doors if you pursue it. Yeah. Like, I think that's that's the issue. Like, don't look for somebody famous. Look right. for somebody consistent. Yeah. Maybe right. even look for somebody boring. Not saying that Pastor Jimmy's Whoa. boring. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, like, just. Yeah. Like, who, who has a marriage that you like you want to have? Mm-hmm. Who, who has, has health? Who has healthy like, church? I mean, who exactly. has a healthy yeah. business? Who has a health rather than. Well, I think, I mean, you know, when you talk about that, I think at the end of the day, like healthy is the most attractive thing on the planet. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I think a healthy vulnerability will keep people. Mm-hmm. But I think health in general is attractive because like nobody's healthy. No. And I'm not yeah. talking about like fit. I'm talking about healthy in your soul, yeah. healthy in your emotions. And that doesn't mean perfect, but I mean, healthy like, that's a big deal, man. Yeah. But when you prioritize, I mean, because healthy to me, defining it, because, right, that's subjective for some people, oh, yeah. you know, um, you're prioritizing long game at that's all right. points, right? You're mission minded in all facets. And I think that's very countercultural, oh, you know, I mean, because even in moments we say we want to pursue health, but that's often like really uncomfortable for Mm -hmm. people, you know, that puts a halt on situations when people are revving up the gas, you know? And I mean, um, but I think you're right. I think it's contagious. And I think there, I mean, health is, it's immediately connected to peace, you know? So So I think when people feel like that health Mm -hmm. is so like, oh my, I just kind of sit here with that, you know? And it's connected in all aspects of our life. So, I mean, you know, y'all heard me say that, but, we can't look at examples in just one area of life. No. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's so one of your, my Will's favorite things that you talk about. Yeah, you have to look at somebody's holistic life yeah. and say, is that healthy? Right. Not somebody's singular aspect of their life and say, that's healthy. Right. And so it's really the balance of how do they navigate their family? How do they prioritize their marriage? How is their relationship with God? You know, 
their finances, all those things, it's multiple things, multiple layers. And so when people in, and that's why I think probably when we talked about vulnerability, it's Mm -hmm. such a big deal to me, right? Because you actually don't know people until they're vulnerable enough to open up about those things. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like I can put out a perception, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that it's worth following. No. And so how then do we uh, have a healthy vulnerability so that people as, as leaders, how do we have that healthy vulnerability so that people actually can be stewards and know if Mm -hmm. what they're following is actually healthy. Yeah. Do you see, I mean like that, that's, that's the, that's the piece. And I think that's what's so incredible about Jesus. Just going back to him is like, he was incredibly vulnerable with his disciples. Yeah. Incredibly vulnerable. And so they, they, he modeled for them. How do you do this for the Mm -hmm. long game? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like how how are you going to, how's this going to happen? And I mean, it's pretty amazing. Like, I mean, we After should the do a podcast the on the life of Jesus. Yeah, it's, ridi- it's so I mean, it's good if you think about unreal. it. Yeah, that, that would be a uh, thirty-four part series. <laughs> on, uh, but you know what's <laughs> astounding though is like, what do we really have historical record of Jesus? So we take all it's the nice, gospels yeah. and it's like what seventeen days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So it's only like seventeen days of his life yeah. that we actually have documented yeah. as a whole. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now I know that there's sections of his life, but mm-hmm. it speaks to. But, I mean, you think about the wealth that is in those just few days that we have documented of how he operated. Yeah. And knowing that that really was a highlight reel. Yeah. And what's so crazy, too, is if you think about it, because obviously scripture, that's his breath, right? So it's if you're, it's like, that's what he knew we would need to lean on, right? Yes. But also how much of a quiet life and into the well that he spent to get that oh my gosh i mean there was a lot of days that he was just being a carpenter right and he was cool with that that's i mean that that, well he was that's like he was homeless he didn't have a a place to live i mean he was constantly yeah you know right just doing his stuff and there was a lot of days guys that he was hanging out with martha and mary and lazarus i mean Like that's, I mean, you could go through it and I know we've done different series and touched about it, but the layers of relationship that Jesus had is astonishing. There's a beauty there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, he had his disciples. They were his followers. He had Peter, James, and John. He had no problem telling the other guys, Hey, y'all hang out here. I'm going to go hang out Peter, James, and John, which (laughs) holy cow, that's a free moment. You (laughs) know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have to take everybody with me on the journey and they have to navigate their own feelings and emotions. What kind of world would we live in if that actually took place? (laughs) And then you had Martha, Lazarus, and um, uh, what was the other one's name? Mary. And they were his close friends. Hmm. Which then totally jacked up everybody because he was friends with two women. Right. Yeah. Like that was wild, you know. And I mean, he got judged for that one, and his give a crap meter was very low, and uh, and he didn't care about it, right? Because he just didn't. He didn't. He didn't worry about the religious sect of that day. Well, and it goes back. They full did not dictate what he did because yeah. of the moment that he had, where he had a, his father look down and say, "That's right." He mm-hmm. knew what his purpose was before he ever did anything in ministry. But see how often do we let our interrelational, right? Like our interactions with other people determine our heart towards the father instead of, okay, I'm going to, you know what I mean? Or or we can't do that because of what people will think. Yeah. Right. Life's too short for that. Come on. Oh my God. You're never going to please them. No. No. And it's like, why do we give that voice in our life to the extent that it dictates people wonder why they don't have joy. It's because they don't have actually freedom to do what the Father says do. They're consistently living under the bondage of others. Yeah. That's good. I mean, Jesus had no, I mean, listen, this is, I was thinking about this the other day. I was reading the Bible. I know. I was reading the Bible. It was shocking. Um, And as I was reading, I was like, man, Jesus broke the Sabbath a lot. Yeah. Like, I was like, he totally, I mean, and they got mad every (laughs) single time. It was almost like he was proving a point. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, how often do we live, mm, how often do we live by legalism when God's offering us to live in freedom? That's, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's not actually like, so I I just think it's a big deal. Don't you think that just makes, drives him crazy? It drives me crazy that he offers us such a life of delight 
And we think we have to suffer through faith. Yeah. I mean, suffer, yes. But you know what I'm saying? Like, we think it's like this dismal way of living. Yeah, I, th- I think th- I think that's the, the, the lie of boundaries. Yeah. Right. For right. sure. Because, mm-hmm. like, You're one of the things. Yeah. I mean, well, you think about it. I mean, I got a fence in my backyard so my kids have freedom. Yeah. That's right. Not so that's that the only don't. way. Right. right. I mean, and so if we really have a correct perspective of boundaries, where actually it's not lessening our freedom it's actually enhancing our freedom it's almost like god says hey i put a creative gene in you Mm -hmm. i want you to go be able to create but this is just the boundary lines for you to create so just go have fun have a party that's what i'm saying like yeah and i think really and that's why you know when we come to talking about church one of the things i talk about with church leaders all the time and one day maybe it'll be a book but it's like hey these are the boundary lines that god placed in at church Mm -hmm. like communion to me is a boundary line like yeah. it's not, it, it's not, he told us to do this every time you gather. Remember to me, people do it different ways, but to me an open door, that's a boundary line. Yeah. And so it's like, Hey man, have freedom. Do all the things in church you want to do. Here's a boundary line. Yeah. Let's just, let's protect the boundary. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a lot of freedom in that instead of it having to be like, did God say that I can do this? Yeah. Well, I mean, he said, you, he didn't say you couldn't Yeah. Right. just made respect his boundaries. Right. And that comes with our marriage, our sex lives, within marriage. That comes with all types of different things that goes on in our life. It's like, man, stop thinking it's about rules. That's mm-hmm. right. And recognize that it is about boundaries. Yeah. But they're for our good and our benefit and our protection, not to limit us in what God created us to be and do. Well, because you wouldn't have peace if it were that version of freedom, right? Like freedom without his provision we know would lead to suffering. Yes. You know? Well, you think about, I mean, if, if, if all this is journeying back to the garden, there was a lot of freedom in the garden. Yeah. I mean, basically he was like, here's a whole garden. One boundary. Yeah. One boundary. And, and they just didn't like that boundary. You know, what's always interesting about the garden too, is like, and I guess there wasn't exact specifications, but how big was it to think how, It had a lot of animals in it. There was, it it was so, you could have never known (laughs) that that tree was I mean, the only animal that wasn't there was cats. That's That's, it. It has to be. Definitely not cats. (laughs) No cats whatsoever. Terrible, terrible creatures. Cats came after the fall, obviously. (laughs) Obviously. Obviously. Prehistoric beast. What a, what a, what a great way to kick off a podcast. I mean, can there. we get a good mm. amen? Let's amen get a good seriously. amen. <laughs> Clear, seriously. So many more things to say. Oh, don't worry. You know. I've got you, uh, when we scheduled you, I made sure I made a note of regular put there <laughs> beside it. So you'll be I'm back. I'm sorry, everyone. You'll be yeah. back no, for sure. It. Thank you for um, coming But thank on. you for being yes. on. Appreciate it. For real. Such Very an honor. Such a, such a cool thing. And we're just blessed to have you as a mm. part yes. of really the house here. Yeah. And so it's really cool. Well, you know, this is a safe space for me and that, you know, you don't even realize you you do that, which when we are talking about mentorship is I already know because I know your heart that when I approach you about something, probably what you might say about it, which is why I would might restrict something. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but I know that's a safe and that's such a gift to me, wow. you know, especially in the position that I'm in. And, um, you know, this is this is fun. Like, I feel like if people feel anxious, struggling, if you sit around and talk about Jesus, it's good yeah, for yourself. It's good. good. Yeah. Well, listen, so good. for those that are listening, this is very important is that we just want you to know what real life is like and what we're walking through. Yeah. Because we do not have it all together. We're on a journey. His yeah. name is Jesus. Yeah. And he is that good. Yeah. That's good. Amen. The good amen. The good amen.